Sims. Kane Sims, the one and only. Britain's finest, Mr. Kane Sims. Dustin. Dustin. Dustin Coates. I like it when you guys are together and talking about boys. Without further ado, welcome to the show. And just like that, we are live. Hello, hello, hello. I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my line immediately. Are you hearing an echo on your side? I'm not. No, no. nothing coming through here. I'm How's that? Us. How's that? Yeah, still sounding so good. 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 All good in the hood. Sounds okay. good. Okay. Yeah. Well. Here we go. We're ready to rumble. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to VUX World. Uh, this is the show where we find the brightest and best minds in the conversational and voice AI space and pick their brains to figure out how they do what they do so that you can do what you do a whole lot better. I'm joined, as always, by Dustin Coates. Dustin, welcome, my friend. Kane, how are you doing? Very well, very well. Excited. The pubs have opened this week in the UK. Don't oh, mean to yeah. gloat and bloat, but, uh, you know, like pretty exciting times. Has life changed at all for you, or it's just the business as usual? Business as usual. I haven't even been to the pub yet. I've walked past a few times with my dog just to soak in a bit of atmosphere, but haven't had the opportunity <laughs> to go <laughs> to go just yet, uh, which is a shame. But uh, Is it just the mind. pubs, or is it is it everything that's open, but people are just excited about the pubs? I think most things have opened, but people are t typically just excited about the pubs. Um, yeah, Fair retail's right. open, restaurants are open. <laughs> um, but yeah, the pubs are taking most of the glory. How about schools? <laughs> are schools open at all? Uh, I don't know. I don't pay attention to that kind of news. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have that problem. I don't know. No, the schools, the schools, the schools are open. Uh, yeah, they're definitely open. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, anyway, Alejandro Esteban, welcome to VUX World. It's an absolute pleasure to have you joining us. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Kane. Thank you, Dustin. No problem. Uh, and if you're just joining us for the first time, I know you guys did a hell of a job at, at recruiting some participants for this discussion. Like you went crazy and invited quite a lot of people. So it may well be that there's some people joining us today who haven't experienced the VUX world phenomenon before. Uh, and if that is the case, then if you uh, enjoy what you listen to and what you hear and what you see today, which I'm sure you will, and you do want to uh, you know, keep abreast of the ins and outs of the practicalities of implementing voice and conversational AI, then do that. Go to vux.world slash subscribe. And uh, what is it you say, Dustin? Subscribe. Smash that subscribe button. Or yeah, smash that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what, I love, what I'm loving, by the way, about the, the crowd that you guys brought on is everybody's mentioning where they're listening from, uh, where they're listening and watching yes. from. So it's nice to see, Indeed. see uh, a lot of different locations, a lot of different places checking in. Indeed, yep. indeed. So, so where are you both based, Alejandro? You're in. Are you in Argentina? I'm actually based in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, part of the time when I'm not traveling around because of business. And uh, Stefan, I'll let you. I am based in, in Palo Alto, in California. Uh, I spent the last uh, three years in Mexico, but I I born in Argentina, like Alejandro. Both of I was us. actually born yeah. in Brazil. So. Oh, you were born in Brazil. We are millennials, okay? We are millennials, digital nomads, and so on. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, it's a pleasure to join us. I know, Esteban, you've been doing some uh, some touring of the US in recent days. Uh, Project Voice, how was Project Voice shaping up yesterday? Very, very good. Uh, even, I think, it, it, it's, it was the first event, personal event, I attended since uh, the COVID issue last year, so it was very, uh, very powerful uh, at a human level, you know, because to stay face to face with people was great. Mm. Very, very good event. Nice. Nice. Yeah, can't wait for that. Can't wait to uh, do some more in person stuff. It feels as though we've been locked up quite a bit for now. Um, but yeah, well, I'm sure we'll get there. I'm sure we'll get there. Hope you're having fun out there in San Francisco. Dustin, it's been a while since you've been to San Francisco, mate. You must be itching to get back over there. Uh, I don't know. I'm enjoying enjoying and sticking around, uh, staying off a plane for a while. It's it's nice to have your feet on the ground. We were talking about some airport uh, 
airport nightmare um, recently before the, the podcast. So still have nightmares here and there about missing flights. <laughs> so Esteban, when you're not running around airports trying to catch flights mm -hmm. uh, and when you're not traveling about doing various conferences and things like that, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and also about a tech store, uh, your company. Okay. Okay, uh, I am the CEO and founder of a Texto. I started in the business. I started a Texto three years ago when we were selected to be accelerated by 500 startups in Mexico City. But I was working in the in the crowdsourcing industry and the, in, at the speech processing industry for the last 15 years, starting in Argentina, and I worked for a decade for. Spanish uh, customers, clients. So that that is my my track record. I am married. I have two two kids, four and ten months. So when I when I don't work, in I, I spend time with my family. Fantastic. Sounds really good. Alejandro, what about yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and and what you do at Texto as well. Sure. So I joined a uh, tech store under a year ago, and I basically been taking care of the commercial strategies. I'm head of sales, kind of uh, dealing with all the customers. Um, the last 10 to 15 years, I've been involved with a contact center industry, digital channels, um, telecommunications companies, having worked mainly around customer experience and the contact centers. So learned a lot about digital channels the voice capabilities, and now we're uh, focuses, focusing on a texto on uh, speech recognition projects and providing the data and the benchmarking for those. Wicked. And we'll come into that in no less than a few minutes, um, because this is going to be a, a, a hugely interesting topic. Uh, it's one of those areas that if people don't realize, I don't think a lot of people who are new to voice AI or even those that work in the industry that tend to use the output of the tools as opposed to getting involved in the actual technology itself probably don't really realize the full extent of what goes into creating this technology and, and training things like speech recognition systems. So can't wait to get involved in that. But there'll be a lot of people tuning in and I think we'll be remiss of us if we didn't mention the news of the week, Dustin, which is Microsoft mm. acquiring Nuance. What do you make about that? It's timely, isn't it? Timely. Uh, I think they they timed it just for us. Uh, no, it's 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 interesting. It's interesting, right? Um, Nuance. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kane, but they actually spun off some of their business a couple of years ago and have been really yeah. doubling down, really focusing on the medical medical aspect of it. So Nuance, obviously, old name and and speech tech, voice tech. Uh, but I was reading the other day that this may just really be a medical play more than it is anything else. Uh, this isn't yeah. Cortana revamped. This isn't, um, I mean, maybe this is um, Microsoft Teams related, but but really getting into that medical industry. What do you think about it? Mm. Yeah, well, I have an article queued up on this exact topic that will be out published tomorrow, um, which is basically exactly that. I think that it's a, it's a healthcare play. Um, I feel for the Nuance customers who are using the IVR and chatbot stuff right now, because I suspect that in the short term, that might be something that might get hit a little bit. Um, I definitely think it's a healthcare play. Microsoft seem to be lining themselves up with very specific vertical kind of industry players. They've had a, they've had a, a cloud offering for healthcare for a while. And this, I think, will be an opportunity for them to make a conversational cloud specifically targeting healthcare. And then from then, I would imagine that there's another conversational cloud for finance, another conversational cloud for, for government. And over time, they become a very huge contender as far as conversational AI technology provision is concerned. But beyond that, and I'm giving away most of the article, but there's more details in it if you check it out tomorrow. Um, but beyond that, if you look at most of the companies who've taken on uh, a, a speech service like Google, the cars that are launching with Google Assistant, the companies that are launching with, with Amazon Connect and Lex, behind that, most of the time, there is some kind of cloud deal involved. Renault uh, and Nissan putting Google Assistant in their vehicles. Behind the scenes, they've just signed cloud deals that power a lot of their infrastructure going forward. Ford, you know, they launched with Google Assistant and Android Auto in their vehicles, and uh, Google have signed a contract with them to provide all of their cloud capability for their smart vehicle strategy. So 
for Microsoft, I'll be thinking, hmm, you know, there's a whole load of potential there for the wider Azure setup. And the other thing that Satya Nadella mentioned in his interview is that he mentioned the partnerships that Nuance have, deep integrations with some of the real core kind of um, EHR systems, um, electronic health record systems in America. <clears throat> and 77% of hospitals use Nuance. So Microsoft have got inroads there into some legacy uh, healthcare systems, which they can exploit uh, quite quite easily and quickly. Um, but Alejandro Esteban, what, what do you reckon about the, the acquisition, Microsoft acquiring Nuance? So um, I think it comes as no surprise, you know, um, Last year and, and this year are, is the year of voice and the year of telemedicine. So um, yeah, definitely Nuance was getting uh, big into the healthcare market. And I think this acqu acquisition has to do particularly with healthcare and uh, voice capabilities. Also the integrations of Nuance with other companies like top names, you know, like Genesis or, or uh, any of those contact center companies, you know, everyone is using Nuance on the back end for voice recognition. So yeah, now the footprint of Microsoft uh, will be definitely advanced with this acquisition. Mm. Comes as no surprise. I didn't know it was gonna be Nuance, but definitely this is happening all over. Everybody's acquiring voice technology. Mm. Are you surprised that it was 20, did you, are you, Alejandro, were you surprised that it was $20 billion? Well, it, it is not the biggest acquisition in the market for a technology company over the last few years. Um, it's it's around the biggest ones, but it's Microsoft buying. So, you know, their checkbook <laughs> has no limits. Deep pockets. I, I think this is the beginning because, as I said, as, as Alejandro said, um, this year and the next one, uh, it's the year of boys, boys technology. And about the amount of money, the, the, I think the important thing is not the amount is the percentage of price the Microsoft uh, paid for Nuance. That is 23%. Because the, the public valuation of Nuance last Friday was uh, $60 billion. And Microsoft paid 23% over that. That's a, 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 a huge percentage, very huge percentage. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Well, yes, definitely interesting times. Um, but unfortunately, arguably, um, or it depends on which way you look at it, but that's one less speech technician uh, technology provider on the market now, which means that your target market has shrunk by one, has it? <laughs> that's, a, that's a way to put it. I mean, we've been having conversations with the two companies about uh, working projects together and we're developing some pro possible projects. Definitely now that their nuance is under Microsoft, well, we'll have to, you know, tailor uh, our engagements further. But uh, yeah, I, you could say that, you know, one one less prospect or customer to talk with. Now we on go the, directly to Microsoft Teams. Exactly. On the other on the other hand, you've got one other company with with far more requirements now, uh, which is good news. Um, so for those that are not familiar with the tech store, then we'll we'll get into some of these details um, around this kind of training speech recognition systems. But for those that are not familiar, Esteban, maybe it'd be nice for you to give us the high level of what a tech store aims to do and what problems are you trying to solve. Okay. Um, a text -to is a, a speech data platform to visualize, level and collect speech data uh, for machine learning training purposes. That means when you are trying to, to develop and to deploy a speech recognition engine, you need to train it first in the language in the accent and in the domain of the people you try to understand and to do that you need training data training data in this case particular case that is speech recognition is speech data that means people talking about certain things uh, related to banking things insurance things or uh, i don't know food and, and so on and we provide that kind of data to our customers to quickly um, train their systems to better under, understand yet their customers. Nice. Um, 
And so, given that you are on the side of being able to um, train speech recognition systems, you inevitably have an understanding of what makes a high-performing speech recognition system. And I know that you're doing a bit of work looking at benchmarking speech recognition providers. Alejandro, you mentioned that previously. Can you give us, in a, in a nutshell, Alejandro, what kind of what constitutes for good performance when it comes to speech recognition and how are you trying to measure that when it comes to this baseline and study that you've been doing excellent so yeah what constitutes uh, good speech recognition from a textos perspective we focus on what we call word so word error rate that is kind of the standard kpi for spe speech recognition and transcription of, of voice to text, so spe speech to text engines. We work heavily around that. We have developed some solutions that are able to benchmark the different outputs of all ASR engines or speech to text engines. And that is part of our platform. And that is a trigger for our customers to decide what sort of models uh, they need to work on, whether they are language models or domain specific models like banking, insurance, hospitality, or, or working on a specific accent, or even going to more complex projects like uh, bias projects. So we have developed a platform that allows them to benchmark against several ASR companies, okay, to take decisions, to benchmark their own data and their own output against these companies, and then uh, once they take the decision of what they need to deploy, they'll get with us to work on what specific data they need to develop. And I mean, customized data because we're not into the off the shelf stuff. We develop a specific project for customized data, which we will pull for uh, from a crowdsourcing platform that we also have developed and provide both voice data and transcription data, which it can be heavily tagged annotated even with sentiment and a lot of other entity tagging and so on and we will give those data sets to the data science uh, uh, sorry data science team and uh, data management teams within this type of companies to work on what they call we call the corpus or speech recognitions now we won't go too much into that uh, what that entails today but basically this is heavy coding on Py on python and uh, tagging words to audio, and this is a way and you train a model for speech recognition and develop additional models. So that's kind of what we do and how we help our customers. Hmm. So in, in this scenario, let me see if I've understood the scenario right then. Let's say that, um, let's say that I am a customer. So are you talking here the 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 speech recognition provider will have a requirement. Maybe they want to improve recognition on a certain accent, or maybe they want to enter into a new market and they need to be able to train their model based on the speech data that will come from the users within a, within a market. Is that first part right? Precisely. I mean, most uh, ASRs are kind of out of the box when you when you purchase the technology if you think of most of the companies they are us based so their language models are mainly oriented to english language uh this doesn't cover everybody right there are some certain companies in europe and in, in asia and even in latin america are developing this technology but as a first those asr companies will have customers elsewhere that need those uh, applications for speech recognitions, those engines to recognize different language models. So that's the first thing we can work with them. We can collect audio data for a specific language model. So that's kind of the first type of projects that we turn to work and provide data for. One good question is why do they need to purchase data? Well, the truth is, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, limitations regarding privacy and confidentiality and so on. And uh, most of the ASR companies cannot use their own data that goes through their engines because it doesn't belong to them. It belongs to their customers. So our customers' data is not usable and our customers' customers' data is not usable. So we're there, we're there to bridge 
that gap where they need data to train the model and it needs to be free of confidentiality and privacy. It can be easily used with no limitations regarding um, any, any restrictions on privacy and so on. Interesting. So if, if let's say, because we've been talking about Microsoft, let's say Microsoft speech recognition, when they use it in, I don't know, let's say PowerPoint. So in PowerPoint, when you're presenting, there's a feature now where it will transcribe what you're saying. Right. And so, the captions at the bottom. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so in this case, we're saying that Microsoft, for privacy reasons, can't use that data to train their models is that right and likewise if a company like the bbc who use microsoft speaks recognition for their beeb assistant they can't microsoft can't use that data either because it technically belongs to the bbc it doesn't necessarily belong to microsoft is are those two scenarios correct exactly those are the two ex scenarios that i just talked about uh, our customer would be microsoft and it doesn't mean that the data that goes through uh, their speech to text engine is usable, especially when it, it comes to data that is used in telemedicine or banking, trading, all sorts of data that can be like very private. So they are not allowed to dig in in most continents. I would say maybe mainly Europe and, and the US is very restrictive. So they will not use the data recorded by the ASRs. And even less if it would be the BBC, right? Because that data be belongs to the BBC and their own customers. So there's further privacy issues. So we're, we're here, there to provide data without that hassle. We, we jump the hurdle of the privacy and confidentiality because every recording that we do, every data set comes from people that agree to sh share this type of data with us for that purpose. And we can, you know, clean up all the config. Uh, if there are repetitions that they need to do or follow a script, we surely will clean up all the conf confidential information like uh, so social security numbers or, or um, you know, um, medical records or whatever private conversations may be involved. So we were able to gather data that can be used for this end uh, result. Yeah. Nice. I can see that being, yeah, the privacy thing is uh, an important topic that comes up time and time again, isn't it? You know, um, but I, I didn't realize, Justin, that there was such a gap from the technology provider's standpoint in not being able to use their own data in some instances. Yeah, I mean, that data ultimately belongs to you, right? And then when you have things like GDPR, I imagine, guys, uh, Alejandro, you mentioned Europe. Um, you have a right to have your data deleted. Um, and when it goes into these models, I imagine that, that makes it really difficult. So it's better just avoiding it altogether. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, now this is not only GDPR. You can, there's so many acronyms that have to do with privacy, right. like HIPAA and healthcare, PII, you know, P PDI. There's, I mean, you go into a, even obvious uh, data issues on banking in every single country, even in Latin America. So privacy is a big issue. Um, most companies are, you know, they will re refrain from using their customers' data to build the models. So they need to find another solution. And that's one of the reasons a texto exists. Mm. Interesting. Um, so what's, I know Stuart Park's comment, comment in here about the Microsoft acquisition, it might be a player to Microsoft to uh, trying to commoditize AI. Stuart, I think that all of those players are on a path to commoditizing AI and even the tooling providers most of the time, um, if you look at most of the tooling providers that don't have their own proprietary technology, um, that's kind of almost on the verge of becoming commoditized as well. I think it's almost going to be like, um, what's the word, uh, hosting, you know? No one really cares where you host your website because hosting is hosting. And I think over time, that might yeah. be where, where we end up, you know? I think uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and deep learning and so on uh, are the the same kind of technology or, or, or the same kind of uh, revolution that was internet. And for us right now, internet 
it's a commodity or it's in, invisible, but it's very important in our lives. Or, or software, uh, 50 years ago, uh, software will eat it, the world and machine learning and artificial intelligence will eat the world in the next two decades. And I don't think Microsoft is attempting to, to commoditize. They, he, they are attempting to, to conquer the, 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 a big part of the, of the market. Nice. Cool. Thanks for that question, Stuart. If you do have questions uh, for Esteban and Alejandro, please do stick them in the comments, whether you're on LinkedIn or YouTube, and we'll do our very best to get to them. Um, okay, so so we've identified then that um, companies that provide speech recognition technology have a hard time using their own data to train their models, and that you can fill that gap by providing that data, it sounds as though, and we'll get into this maybe a little bit later, but it sounds as though a little bit of a kind of like a user Zoom style or user testing.com or Pulse Lab style arrangement where you have a huge panel of users and maybe even recruiting new users based on the specific accents or voices or whatever that you want to find. And you use that panel to gather training data. That's how it works, is it? Yes, I mean, we, we have developed two platforms. One is that is used by users and it's a strictly a crowdsourcing platform where we will be able to activate an audience to do a specific collection of voice and transcription and more, right? Then the other platform we developed is for the data management by our customers of those collections. So they're able to, to you know, listen to the audio, download transcriptions, look at the metadata from the users, et cetera. That combination uh, between crowdsourcing and software for our customers is what differentiates a texto mainly in the market right now. And what would lead to a company recognizing a need to require training? data in the first place? Is it mostly down to accents and expansion into new languages and things like that? Or are there any other things that would trigger the need for a, for a company to want to either train or retrain their ASR? Traditional, traditionally, you know, most of the projects and the triggers are around building language models, specific accents and so on. But, uh, you know, this is the year of bias on AI and the discussions have, have been starting for, for, for series for the first time. Uh, companies with this type of technology are looking at bias specifically too. So they're starting to notice that certain ethnicities, you know, a, uh, the speech to text engines are not able to recognize that uh, ethnic origin accent, okay? or even looking at uh, bias on gender, you know, uh, even bias, bias of um, different accents uh, within the US or so on. So that is another type of a uh, solution we provide. We are able to collect very specific data sets that will help balance bias. And this is a, a big thing right now. So we're, we, if, if a customer uh, asks us, you know, I need to bias, uh, I need to level my ASR because it's just not recognizing, um, you know, African American speakers or something like that, or for a, a country, um, a company that's uh, deploying in Switzerland, they're not able to uh, uh, understand. Uh, they they understand Swiss, Swiss French, Swiss uh, German, but Swiss Italians. Are not being recognized and this is something that another company is uh, uh, suffering right now so those type of projects are are kind of uh, becoming new it's not only about language and accent it's about gender uh, it's about bias on gender on ethnicity on age even you know because even you know japanese speakers that are over 40 speak completely different for uh, Japanese millennials, for, for example. So this type of projects and tuning is already happening and we're participating also in providing the data to uh, level the recognition. So to, to kind of balance the models towards an understanding everybody that may go through that speech to text engine rather than um, 
just basing a, a speech to text on on a whiteness that you would say you know mm. um so that's another very important issues that, that we take care of constant bias mm. it's interesting is is there any um I found one thing here, but I'd be interested to know if you've got any more. So, so I just did a quick little Google and found that uh, th there was a, a company that have tested Amazon, Apple, Google, IBM, and Microsoft um, systems. This was back in 2020. And it says that the systems, systems, so it doesn't pull out specifically which ones in particular, but in general, these systems misidentified words about 19% of the time with white people and with black people, mistakes jumped to 33%, uh, 35%, which is a quote from the article. So there's obviously a huge issue uh, there. And when we think about, you know, Stuart was talking about commoditizing AI, we kind of talk about democratizing AI as in uh, being allowing it to be open to, to be used by everybody, which is another area that Microsoft could succeed in because given that they've got the active directory management for most organizations and um they have the the kind of ability there to provide them services voice recognition services biometrics to um to um you know workers but if it only works for you know 80 or 70 percent of your workers uh, or, or less than that then it's it's obviously a huge issue is there any difference with training speech recognition systems as far as what a text or do is there anything that's different in particular when training um for these different disparities any any processes that you would follow differently well um i think personally it's all about the project itself and yes we it's about the democratization of of the data but uh it, it would be kind of a contradiction to say on a biased project you will get democratic data because it's exactly the opposite on a, this type of a project to democratize a speech to text engine so that it recognizes every uh, accent, every ethnicity at the same percentage of error, then you would need to actually get granular on the data and customize a data set where you provide the balance you want. So if you're not recognizing uh, uh, Native Americans, then you will get a data set that weighs Native Americans much more than white Americans. And that you will use to train your, your speech to text engine, kind of balancing it out towards the minority that's being left out on the speech to text engine. So it kind of works like that. So yes, democratization of the ASR is very important. How do you do, do it? by getting data sets that balance toward minority. Nice. Stuart Parker's pointed out, check out Coded Bias on Netflix, which I've heard about actually, but I haven't watched it yet. Have you, have, you, have you seen it, Dustin? I have not. I have not. Alejandro Esteban, have you seen this documentary? Unfortunately, um, I have not yet. I have heard about no. it. I'll probably watch it soon. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. the bias topic is a, is a very important topic. Uh, uh, it's not only a, a, a matter of, of business, it's a matter of, of justice, you know, of, of, of democracy. And um, we are really committed with, with, with the, this topic of, of remove to help the companies to remove bias, to remove injustice in, in related to people. Mm. It's interesting because in, in a in whether it's happened quicker or not, I don't know, because because this technology has been around for a long time. But it feels, at least, that this discussion is being had a lot earlier than it was had with the web. Like in 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 the EU, it's only become legislation that your website has to be accessible to a double A grade um, standard. It's only become legislation in the last like four years. So websites existed for decades before. And there was no kind of legislative requirement for those websites to be accessible for people with either color blindness or people with, you know, who, who need kind of like um, equipment to help them navigate websites or what have you, like screen readers or whatever. Um, whereas this discussion seems, at least on the face of it, to be happening a lot earlier in 
in this conversation, which I think is is obviously a positive. Does it need regulating? Does it need to be a, a, um, a thing that's regulated that says that all speech recognition systems or all conversational AI technology has to have a certain level of performance for, you know, X groups of people or not? I don't know what uh, Esteban's opinion is on this. I feel personally that this will eventually become regulated. You know, everything is about um, bias right now uh, in every aspect, whether it's rent, totally, uh, totally race, and so on. So eventually it will be regulated. And whether it's a conversation or not, the speech to text companies are already looking at fixing and working on these biases as we speak. You know, we have projects like that with very important companies. So it's a reality. Whether it when it will become regulated, I, I don't know, but it's uh, it seems like something that will be regulated eventually. Mm. What do you think, Dustin? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think Alejandro and Esteban both uh, have a very unique perspective, very interesting perspective as well. Um, there's a lot of data flowing in. There's a lot of privacy concerns. There's a lot of fairness concerns as well. Uh, one question <clears throat> that I have for the two of you based on what you've been bringing up so far, is I think a lot of people who aren't really uh, technical or in ML, they feel like the models are these these magic things and they're really everything that's powering it. But people like yourselves who are in the field uh, will often say what is 90, 90% the data more than it is the model. And the, the, the feeling that I have listening to you guys is that for ASR, the data is even more important uh, than perhaps other fields like uh, named entity recognition or things like that. Is that an accurate assessment? And is that why it's so important for platforms like yours to exist? Well, what do you think, Esteban? In my opinion, data is very important for building the models. If you don't have the data, the recognition that your model experiences is very limited. Um, you could have the best coders in in house doing uh, running the best models, but if they didn't plug a hundred ways to order a pizza differently, then that model will only recognize one Italian guy ordering a pizza. <laughs> For machine learning, I think for machine learning data, it's like uh, UX UI for traditional software. If you don't have UX UI, if you da don't have a, a good customer experience, you don't have customers. No, doesn't matter how powerful are your servers or how powerful are your software. If, if your customer experience is bad, customers going to other place. With machine learning, the data is like the, the UX UI. If you don't have good data, your software doesn't understand people. If you doesn't understand people, people go to other companies. Mm. Interesting. What it's would crucial. Be... Data is crucial, I, I mm. think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, 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 it's the foundations, isn't it? Um, what well, would not, be the... Not just a... Go on. I was just going to say, not just a lot of data as well, but also good data too, which I, I think is what's interesting about a platform like yours. Uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, two guys, I saw recent that, recently that uh, ImageNet, for example, you know, baseline for image recognition models, uh, I think it was what something between 10 and maybe I'm making that up, but a large percentage of the labels in that ImageNet data were labeled incorrectly. So it's important to have exactly. yeah, well-labeled data too, or well-transcribed data. Exactly. Here, so. Like in computer vision, the labels in audio data is the transcription data. So you need to have you need to have a, a very accurate uh, transcription of those audios to properly train your machine learning algorithms. So it's it's the same thing. And, but you have a, a, a huge difference with computer vision. When you already tagged all the animals and all the cars and all the tracks in the world, you don't have new animals or new cars or new things to, to tag, to level. In the speech recognition, it's different because humans are changing the ways they are speaking every year. 
every month. We, as a, as a humanity, we are creating culture, we are creating new uh, ways to, when that's occur, you need to retrain your, uh, your algorithms, your engines. Mm. So yeah, language is con uh, language and, and uh, yeah, um, language is con constantly evol evolving. So if language evolves, but uh, natural language processing doesn't evolve with the new language standards, then it's going no nowhere. So it's, it's a never ending task to evolve speech to text because uh, humans are constantly changing the way they speak, adding new words, taking words from other languages into their own language, exporting some of their words to other languages. So that needs to be considered in, in natural language processing also. Mm. Yeah, COVID wasn't a common word, was it, uh, up until a year or so ago? Does that mean then that, that this activity isn't actually just about training it on new things, as in new accents, new languages, new ethnicities, new genders, things like that? But it's also about when you've done that, maintaining that. Is is there a a kind of rolling nature of constant training, constant tweaking, constant improvement to these things? Well, it's a good example what what you talked about with COVID. So even with one of our customers right now, which is into telemedicine, and we're kind of building the model with our data. You look at COVID and somebody says COVID, somebody says COVID-19, somebody says Corona, somebody says SARS-CoV-2. There are so many ways to actually say that word and don't even get me on the, ac the possible accents on how they can sound, right? Mm. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of annotation regarding the variance of one word. So that's kind of the data, what data sets help provide, you know, get me the people speaking and saying COVID in all the ways they say it, so I can annotate it and take it to my model. Interesting. And, and can you... Go on to say Oh, go ahead, Ken. Oh, no, I was no, just no, curious. Ahead, as well. Yeah, I was, I was just curious as well. And, you know, talk, you talk about language evolving, but languages also become extinct and, and things like that. And you've got some languages that have much fewer speakers. Are you able to do, you know, a, transfer learning of sorts where let's say Navajo or Welsh or one of these languages that are one of the big 10 that you're still able to build a good speech recognition for them or is there some point where the, the number of speakers is just so small that you're really not going to be able to get enough data? Well, in a text store, we, when we get together with Esteban and customers, we'll pretty much jump on any challenge, right? And uh, there, there, there's been questions about, you know, hey, get me Sulu speakers, you know, or get me, you know, uh, it's not extinct, but I don't even remember the, uh, the name of the fourth language in Switzerland. But yes, we are willing to try to collect those type of utterances or correct transcriptions around those type of utterances. So yeah, there is the possibility of kind of doing collections to kind of save safeguard those type of uh, almost extinct language models. You know, there there is something to do where you could collect and kind of work on those models <coughs> and save it for the future of humanity before they are not present anymore. So. I would say yes. And this is and this is related to our business model. Our <coughs> main thing about our business model that is we are collecting custom built data sets, custom built speech data sets that our clients ask us to collect and label. So we are not selling off the shelf data sets for a couple of years ago for, from determined ge geographies. We collect custom builds to follow the necessities of our clients. Mm. And that could be Welsh or it could be, you know, whatever you may think of. Different projects, different challenges have different costs, you know, obviously. But yes, I, I mean, that is a type of project that we would also work on, you know.
mm. collecting the very specific data from specific languages. Mm. Interesting. So, so we've spoke about we've spoke about where the need might come from for for people to want to train their rec speech recognition systems, and we've spoke about how it might be accents, it might be to address biases, it might be because language evolves and changes, it might be expansion into other countries, things like that. We've touched on a little bit about how you kind of go about doing it. And you've mentioned that you kind of can go out and you outreach, you find people, you get them to record voices, you bring that in, you annotate, you label, things like that. You've also got the other side of the platform, which allows um, your clients to, what they upload their samples, do they? On the, other, on the cloud side, they upload their samples. And well, let's just clarify this part first before I move on, because I want to know what happens next. But, but in one environment, you go out, you find users they record sample data they uh uh you know send that data into the the client they can then label and annotate and things like that the other side around benchmarking and the the kind of cloud power what happens on that side okay so kind of the workflow for this for example for a voice data project would be you know we work with our customers regarding what sort of scripts or prompts or what type of spontaneous voice collection they need to develop. And we will create a project on our crowdsourcing platform to get specific audiences by language, residence, gender, whatever we want to kind of record those collections, get them automatically transcribed and get them corrected to the standard that is needed to, for machine learning. Besides that, Another workflow could be we could work on our customers' audios too. So we pull their audios, we post them on a project, and we get the transcriptions corrected for them to refeed that back to, to their models. So that would be the normal uh, workflow. Either, either we work on specific prompts, scripts, or uh, develop the spontaneous data type project that we need to collect those voices, or we transcribe what's already th there, which the ASR is transcribing to 60% and we take it to 100 or 99.99 because .99, nobody can say a transcription is perfect. Um, that is a main workflow. The other is kind of a, a nice to have when you're talking about ASR comparison, this is a tool we have developed to help our customers take decisions. And we even have a free version that sometimes we let our customers use when they're buying data sets uh, from us to, to do some testing. Um, we are go moving into the benchmarking uh, aspect of this and trying to become a trusted advisor in terms of ASR comparison. And this is why we, for example, developed the ASR championship, which is very public on LinkedIn, and we're putting the big guys against each other, you know, Amazon Transcribe against IBM Watson. I will do it for Google and we'll bring the smaller ones and hopefully in the future, new ones will want to participate too and Microsoft Lewis and so on. So um, this is to create a standard and tell everybody publicly, you know, for English or for German, for this type of data, which is contact center based and they're talking about banking, you know, this is how the different ASR companies are pe performing for this data set. And this will give them an idea, okay, this um, uh, actually rings a bell for me, which I am a bank. And uh, based on this, I will most likely choose this type of engine rather than the other one that worked better for hospitality and so on. So this is what we're trying to do with the ASR comparison. Um, but the workflow basically with our customers is, you know, gathering, um, the data they need, and we will work on scripts. We will tag their audios and transcriptions, and so on. And that's and, and, and it's important. That to, also, it's important to say, complementing Alexandro, that uh, through our platform, our clients can manage uh, third-party data or third-party transcriptions too. They can uh, upload audio and, and transcription from other sources and and they can level it and manage through our platform hmm. it's no surprise guys we have competitors you know there are people trying to do what we do there are people uh, there are companies that are, don't only do speech recognition they're into imagery you know the main difference is we also provide a, a platform for management of data to our, our customers this i haven't seen too much around both the collection side 
and the management side, right? So that, that is kind of our differentiator and why our customers mainly choose us, I would say. I haven't seen many companies similar anyway. Maybe it's because I'm not kind of having my eyes peeled in that direction. But Dustin, I don't know if you were aware of that many other companies that do this kind of thing. I don't think that there is think, many think, companies, think, but... I think Dustin's um, on mute there. Are you on mute there, Dustin? I am oh, sorry. There. Yeah, I was on mute. Oh, no, no, I, think no, I was no. going to say the same thing as... Yeah, I was going to say the, thing, the same thing as Esteban. So Esteban, you probably you know tons more than I do, so you go ahead. I don't think there is many companies doing uh, gathering data for machine learning, but uh, the, the, the industry is becoming hot. A um, few minutes ago, some, someone in the audience uh, says that mentioned it, the, the multiples uh, about nuance. And this week, too, another company from the computer vision data industry called Scale raised money, uh, a lot of money, um, at a 100x revenue valuation. 100x. Wow. That's wow. A, a lot of uh, multiples, you know. Who, who was that? What Mo company was that? Scale. 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 They are. They are. They are uh, specialized in computer vision and autonomous cars and so on. Oh, okay. They are they are not doing this kind of data, but but it's pure data company. Wow. Facebook acquired them, didn't they? Yeah, I think it was no. Facebook. Was it not? Who was it that uh, acquired uh, Scale AI? Stevan, we just talked about it like two days ago. Uh, I can I'm see sorry. an article from Facebook. Yeah. Anyway, the you ask me, yes, there are certain companies that compete with us, you know, and some are very large. We are a startup, we're well funded, and we have some nice clients, but we're going against some, some big guys. But those big guys have focused a lot around off the shelf data sets, which means, you know, um, you buy a, a data set. If you're a speech recognition company, you will work on that data set, and possibly that same data set will be available to your competitor and the model you can build from it will be exactly the same. So we're into variance, basically, and that also defines a text a little bit. Nice. And who is it that will be using this platform? Who, who is it that is your user? Like, who are the people in the companies that actually do this work, this, this data training work? Like, if, if a client came to you tomorrow, what kind of team would they have on their side that would work with you to do this stuff? Oof, that, that is crazy because I get to talk to like great people, very knowledgeable, very technical. Sometimes it's even a, a little bit, you know, um, like um, emb embarrassing. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> those are mostly we, we get to talk to a lot of product uh, owners, you know, product managers, the people that actually develop the speech rec uh, recognition products. So those are brainiacs uh we talk uh, to the data science in uh, data science teams the data management teams these are usually people that have phds in data science uh, and so on that are helping with with the natural language processing models themselves and analyzing the data and doing some entity tagging and so on and customizations so to summarize it would be you know a lot of product management people um data scientists, data managers from these technology companies, because most of our customers are technology companies themselves. Nice. And then after this, and I appreciate that you, you might not work solely closely to, to this kind of, this part of the process, but once they've got data, they've labeled it, they've, they've done their thing, in the textile platform, what happens? <laughs> What's the next step? Like, what do they get? Is it, you know, what happens after that? Stevan can probably give you some more technical details, but to summarize, they will take individual words and individual phrases and tag them to specific audio words and phrases within the corpus of their model. And that 
like I said, is usually something that has been built on Python. It's coding uh, in essence, but you know, getting the the data behind the the coding. So besides the coding, it's labeling data inside the corpus to to tell a, a model that you know this guy, this word is saying this and is attached to this audio. Okay, and once they collect that, we we usually have a lot of exchanges with our own project team regarding curating the data and so on and kind of um, since they test a lot before going to production, they'll come back, we'll do some additional uh, tagging and annotation and so on, or provide additional data sets that they require. But basically, uh, you know, we will provide the data. What they do on their side depends a little bit on the quality of their own team. Perhaps in the future, we will be the ones with our own teams working on their corpuses, but that's not where we are right now. Nice. Dustin, you found the article on Scale AI. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they raised it a $7 billion uh, valuation. It doubled their valuation in four months. It's it's crazy. Um, I think I think it's, it's a little extreme. Crazy, when people yeah. And yeah. it's a pure data company that like a tech store. And my, my long-term vision about the, the topic you mentioned, it, Kane, uh, we at Atexto, we 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 will be the human factor in AI for speech recognition. We we are building the infrastructure for humans to teach to teach machines interact with humans, and we are specialized and specializing in in this problem. Interesting. Nice. Um, Okay, well, I think we're any other any other thoughts, Dustin. I think we're pretty much on time. Uh, a couple of minutes left. Any final thoughts, Dustin? Any last questions for Esteban and Alejandro? No, I think we covered a lot. Thank you so much for for appearing today, and thanks. Uh, there's a, starting to be a, a good uh, good conversation in the comments as well. Unfortunately, we didn't get to any of it. Uh, I think a lot of it was in Spanish, but I, I went through Google yeah. Translate and and got some of the sense of it. Um, my high school Spanish didn't help me too much there. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for everyone who joined. And again, smash that like button, as they say on, <laughs> on YouTube. And the subscribe button, indeed. And the subscribe, yeah. Dot world uh, forward slash subscribe if you do want to keep <laughs> the rest of these conversations similar to this. Uh, Esteban, Alejandro, where can people learn more about a tech store uh, and find out more about what you're up to and even reach out if they if they feel they need to do so? Absolutely. Yeah, you go into our website, you know, fill in the form, we'll get in touch with you, or even uh, it will lead you towards if you're out of work, go into the workup so you can you know, contribute yeah. to voice and, and transcription and, and will we'll help you move forward. Um, otherwise, you know, reach out directly to my email, which uh, I'll, it's alejandro at a text.com. You know, I'll happy to help with any questions. Cool. Fantastic. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. It's been a real pleasure, Esteban and Alejandro. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You, Justin and Kane, it was a pleasure, and I hope we had a good time today. We had a very good time. I certainly okay. had a good time. Justin, did you have a good time? I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. I want to repeat. I want to repeat this. <laughs> yes, let's do that. Let's let's repeat this uh, next, month. Soon. next month. We'll do it again next week. Uh, we can't do it next <laughs> week because because next week, uh, who's on the show next week? Uh, Le Leticia Kaletu uh, from Accenture is going to be joining us mm -hmm. to speak a little bit about how Accenture are approaching conversational AI, a little bit about the Liquid Studio in London uh, and, and innovations that they've been working on there. They just got a patent uh, granted and the patent is titled something like hyper-personalized voice AI, uh, which is an intriguing title. And so that's what we're going to be talking about next week. Uh, so do go to vux.world forward slash subscribe if you want to be a part of that conversation. Again, a tech store team, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And as Dustin said, apologies, we didn't get to uh, to many of the comments. Uh, my Spanish is equally and probably poorer than <laughs> Dustin's because Dustin <laughs> does have quite a few other languages under his belt uh, living in Paris, <laughs> don't you? Uh, a few, a few. But yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day, guys. Have a Thank you very great much. day. Looking forward to our conversation.